Good evening, everyone. How are y'all? Good. I'm Scott Martin. I'm the Parks Director for Floyd's Fork, and it's my pleasure tonight to both welcome y'all and tell you thank you again on behalf of all of us here for your membership and your support of the park. Thanks to you all voluntarily stepping up and becoming members. Uh, we thought we had 350,000 visitors last year. We had 800,000. So we're all making this happen. I'm going to jump right into this. It's a neat night for us because you have in front of you the panel that not only really came up with the vision of the project, but also are executing it. And I can't think of many park projects in our country where you can have idea to execution all in one table at one time. And not to put any more pressure on them, but it would be the equivalent of having Olmstead sitting in the room with the first parks director. So I think he's got to be able to handle it. Uh, so each one's going to go for about 10 minutes with the slides, then we'll transition you through and we're going to follow the process and the progress of the park. After that, we'll be happy to take questions. So if you have questions, jot them down and we'll grab you guys as we go. I'm going to start with the creator of the project, Dan Jones, who, um, as he likes to term it, had a midlife crisis, a career change, and a way to change the city all at one time, and he got involved and created this project. And Dan's going to kick it off by telling us how you come up with the idea of doing city shaping infrastructure and uh, coming up with the biggest park project underway in the United States right now. Dan. Actually, the third thing was sabbatical. So it's going to change the on midlife crisis. So. Um, well, thanks again. I want to echo Scott's um, thank you to you all. Um, we are a donor-supported public park, which is a strange piece, certainly in Louisville, um, but really everywhere. Um, we all know public budgets are getting tighter and tighter, and so um, your all's willingness to become members and really sort of be at the forefront of what we hope, you know, someday is 10,000 members is critical to this project because we want it to not only be a well-designed, well-built project, but we want it to always be safe, clean, fun, and beautiful. And your all's funding is what makes that happen. So, um, so I'm going to talk to you very quickly about um, uh, really just the kind of the moment of inspiration for this project. I don't take a lot of credit for that, but I, I did answer a question that was asked. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Olmstead and you know kind of we you know we very much pay homage to, to what he did and why we think he is so relevant to Louisville but also globally. And then I'm going to just make a few observations. I'm not an architect, but we have learned we think some fairly interesting things about park design that you guys can say those make sense or they don't make sense or whatever. But uh, to start with, the origin of this project is very simple, and that is. Um, we had built a park on River Road called Thurman Hutchins Park, which we donated to the city. I got to know the Parks Department, and consequently, when Metro Parks and the Olmsted Parks Conservancy were doing their next round of strategic planning, I got invited to a meeting. They had these 10 questions they asked a lot of community leaders, and I don't remember nine of them, uh, but one of them that was, what could our generation do that would have the same impact as the original Olmsted generation and the Olmsted Parks? And I was originally a historian, I have a PhD in American history, so I knew a little bit about the story of Olmstead. Um, and I didn't really think about it right away. I left the meeting, I went back to my, my day job, but I gradually uh, began to think, well, you know, there's a pretty simple answer to that, and that is we need to do again what they did, and that's get out ahead of the development curve, get enough land to build not a single park as we did with Thurman Hutchins, but a real system. Um, and you're going to hear some of the people that were involved sort of at the stair step uh, from that moment to here. But that's really how it started. I hired uh, Dan Church and Jim Walters at Revira for $35,000 to, you know, could we do it? So where would we do it? And now it's about a $150 million project. So um, so that's how it began. Um, the, the next thing I want, so Olmstead is very much, uh, we believe Olmstead is still very relevant. And I just want to talk to you a little bit initially about why we think that. Um, the and, uh, let's see. The first point is when Olmsted really began his career in the 1850s with Central Park in New York, all the way up to Louisville, which was his last Olmsted Senior's last design. In the United States of America was urbanizing. People were pouring in from the cities. The Industrial Revolution was going on. Well, essentially, that's what's happening in the rest of the world. If you pay any attention to what's happening in India, what's happening in China, what's happening in Brazil, people are pouring in. And the favelas of Brazil, the slums of Mumbai, are, in my opinion, directly analogous to the tenements in New York City 
in the late 19th century. And so this idea that you can build parks ahead of the growth of the city uh, and create spaces for people who live in crowded urban environments to get out and to recreate and so on, uh, we think is still very important. It's not our idea, it sounds very obvious, but it's not really applied, um, in our opinion, in the way it should be. So that's the first way uh, that we are applying Olmstead and that we think Olmstead is very relevant. Um, the second thing is, and I've kind of touched on this, but when Olmstead built Central Park in New York, which begins at 59th Street in the south, Manhattan was at about 30th Street. It was 30 blocks uh, uh, to the south, and basically, you know, they named it Central Park, right? Even though the city was nowhere close to it, they were putting it in ahead of the growth of the city. And that really simple idea, think about any other kind of infrastructure, whether it's parks or roads or bridges or whatever it might be, if you put it in first, it works a whole lot better than if you try to come back and retrofit, right? It's more expensive, it's politically difficult, and so on. And that basic idea Olmsted applied all around the country. And uh, he started in 1850 in New York, and then in the late 1850s. And then in 1891, he came to Louisville, when we were about the size of that blob, and laid out the three parks and the connecting parkways. And then the city grew around them. And again, you know, our basic idea, what you see here is the parklands, is to do that again. And really, the only significant difference is that we're well behind where Louisville was in the 1890s. As you all know, you live out here, there's been a lot of growth already. So um, we were fortunate to be able to, you know, assemble the land that we want, to assemble it as a connected project. But that's the basic idea. Uh, the next point about Olmsted is, so, urbanizing world of today is directly analogous, so the lesson still applies. Number two, put the infrastructure in first. Number three is don't just stop the planning at the boundary of the park. Olmsted designed the boundary roads in the highlands, so that and he, he designed many of the neighborhoods so that the houses face into the park rather than turning their backyards to the park and so on. So you can't plan a park in isolation. And I think that is probably our biggest struggle, frankly, is, is trying to get the city interested enough in what happens out here so that that process has, you know, we're a stakeholder in that process. We don't own land beyond the boundaries of the park. But nevertheless, Olmsted was wise enough to realize that the interface of the park with surrounding development was a very important part of the design of the parks themselves. Um, okay, I might have dropped the slide here. Um, okay, the last, the last principle is this. Um, there's a controversy in the design of parks right now that says that great design, great architecture is a concern only of the elites. That it doesn't really matter, it's, it's you know, it, uh, well, we, we don't agree with that. You know from, you've seen these bridges, you've seen the roads, you've seen the investments we make. Um, we believe that great architecture, great planning, and great design is what makes great parks. That you can have them. Many of those things are very subtle. And so I just want to emphasize, you know, sort of what we've learned about that. And these are principles that I think about. They might, some of the architects might think about them slightly differently. Um, but the first piece is access and connectivity. If you can't get into the park, how are you going to use it? If once you get into it, you can't move smoothly through it, whether you're in a car, on a bike, on foot, uh, et cetera, um, it, it doesn't work as well. If you look at the great Olmsted designs, these issues of access and connectivity were always important. Um, every great park should have a form, and I'm going to show you a nice picture uh, in a minute, uh, but at the end of the day, if you ask me to define what really makes a good park, an urban park, it's a great circulation plan that connects a bunch of special places. Those special places could be natural places, something that already exists, they could be a historical artifact, they could be something new and designed. And as you think about it, when you go out tomorrow or the next day and you walk around this park, I hope that you will see this idea of circulation connecting special places. Um, parks should be built for both people and nature. As obvious as that sounds, in the parks world, there are the sort of people-centric park planners and the nature-centric park planners. We don't see the division. We think that both are important. And at the end of the day, if people don't support your park, it doesn't really matter what else you've done that's good. Um, design for the 90%. And what we mean by that is you don't see a lot of baseball parks out here. Um, we don't have anything against baseball parks. We think they're important, but they're 10% uses. When they're active, um, they're heavily used. The rest of the time, which is most of the time, they're not. Um, and so we have really tried to design amenities 
that serve the 90%. And I think one of the reasons that we doubled our expected um, attendance is that that works. And the, the best way to test this is if you're ever in New York City or a big city like that, just go sit on a bench for 30 minutes and watch what happens. And what you'll see is that 90% of what happens is random and individualized. It's what's the 90% do. Somebody's walking through for exercise. They're going to eat lunch. They're going to put their picnic blanket down and have a picnic. They're out with their significant other. They're throwing a Frisbee on a field. And that really is what we designed this park around, is that 90% use. So um, plan for, the last one is plan for the long term. You know, parks are very different than almost any other kind of infrastructure. If you go to London or Paris, the only infrastructure that really hasn't changed much in three or 500 years are the parks. The Wad alone in Paris, Hyde Park in London, and so on. So just a couple, just re-emphasize, access and connectivity. The bridges, obviously, are one of the great symbols of that. Um, if that's not a beautiful form, architecturally, I don't know what is. Uh, and I, you know, that's you know, due to the great architects we have on this. You can also very clearly see the circulation plan, right? You see the Grand Allee, you see the Park Drive, you see the Little Loop, and so on. Um, this is another example of form. This is Turkey Run Park, which is the park that's under construction now. Uh, I call it the quiet park. Uh, it's mostly trees and fields, but mo many of those forested areas don't exist today, and many of those fields don't have the form today. That's the architecture that as we grow it in over the next 20 or 30 years. But again, it's, it's a very significant and strong form. Uh, people and nature, and the canoe trail is a great uh, example of that. Designed for the 90%, I think I've elaborated on that already. Um, random and individualized use. And then, you don't have to read this, but one of the things that we have done is tried to codify what we learned in this project. Because there really isn't another park project in the nation that began with a motivating impulse 10 years ago and is trying to figure out when we're dead and gone, how do we make sure that this park is still clean, safe, fun, and beautiful? And we spent a lot of time uh, thinking about that. We are somewhere, I guess we're kind of in here right now. Of course, your memberships are part of that annual funding box. Uh, so uh, those are the lessons I've learned. I'll take some questions and so on when we get to the next, you know, at the end of the uh, time. But I'll turn it over to Scott for the next person to speak. Thank you. Give him the applause, but here's what's fun. Someone else gave applause and then said, you need some help. So our next speaker is Dan Church, one of the top architects and planners in the region. And he had the wonderful job of trying to make these ideas of Olmstead appear and begin to make sense out here in this region. He'll walk you through that story. If I take, try to take credit where credit is to do, these guys will let me know. <laughs> All right, so uh, with uh, Time Warner, I've become a TV addict, so I want to know, does everybody watch Down the Emmy? Oh, of course. Of course, you never get enough, so you want to see the behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I feel like uh, we are today. I'm getting to say some things that never uh, are known because they go back to time. Another one like last night, person of interest, we're going back in time. And it's uh, uh, we're going back to uh, 2002. Uh, what I wanted uh, was asked to talk about a couple of different things, and I selected the initial planning phase. We'll call that, and uh, I would bracket that as from the uh, concept to uh, consultant selection. And uh, back in uh, we, go, we go back to 2002, and Dan has. Uh, and you probably have heard it before in some ways, in form and fashion, and you see what you have out here. 2002, we didn't know where we were really going, okay? So uh, Dan outlined uh, his idea and his concept, and he came to Bravura, and I was working with Jim Walters, and Jim and I go back in time to our work in the, together as students in the 60s, and, and uh, so we, we have a, a, a long-term relationship, but I was with Ed Bravura working for Jim, and uh, he's president of Bavura, and we had, uh, uh, had worked on the waterfront park for eight, nine years. Uh, so uh, Dan came to Bavura, and, uh, and uh, I will say that neither of us is a landscape architect. 
but uh, we have um, done a lot of hard work, as it turns out. So uh, Dan's uh, challenge in 2002, or at least his goal, I think, was as he expressed, you know, he wanted to do something for uh, with the park system, uh, and expand it and create an infrastructure around which the city could grow. And so they're looking at the Floyd's Fork area. Uh, the uh, I had my experience, uh, I will have to say, in, in uh, park planning is from the comprehensive planning point of view. And Jim Walters, and I like to draw the distinction because I have to keep it clear in mind what I do, what I don't do. Well. <laughs> and Jim's uh, experience is in master planning and design. And the distinction I like to draw, are there any people that work in city government? No, but I work, I came out of the tradition of working for city planning. And in, in that process of doing comprehensive planning, you you look into the future, you make projections, you you determine what people's needs are based on criteria. And I've worked on some of that kind of thing in graduate school, but I worked at the planning commission, and I was very familiar with the pl uh, comprehensive planning process. So what we were looking at in terms of this opportunity was to uh, increase the, uh, the parks system for Louisville within the, what I perceived as the within the comprehensive planning process, because you have to understand in 2002 there was no funding for this. And the city didn't get money, so they weren't going to fund it. So you're looking at making plans that can evolve and happen. And also you have to, uh, I, I wrote down a few key things I would have to say. Um, what we do is, uh, in that, is uh, analyze, quantify, and justify. And the, the comprehensive planning process looks at uh, government regulations, and, and you are familiar with the 2020 plan. You look 20 years into the future, you make projections, you see what you're going to do. So I was looking at that from, from that perspective, and that's the difference. I was looking at making a plan and trying to think of a way that implementation might happen. And that's a big distinction, and there's a great leap between doing that and having land and making a park plan for that land and then designing it. And, and uh, I'm sure Jim will, will cover that and you will also understand it based on what I show you. Uh, so when, uh, when Dan came to Bravura, I was fortunate in having the opportunity then to, to gather our resources and, and uh, begin to do the analysis and, and try to seek, we're seeking the vision, you see, because this was an idea and what you see here, and everybody refers to, is the great vision. More than any great vision. Uh, uh, Scott asked me, uh, you know, what is my take on the on the land and making him help having this help to have this uh, uh, be created in my relation to the land? Well, I'll tell you what, my relation to the land was mostly from a development type of point of view. You know, how many houses can you put on it, or? Uh, uh, doing comprehensive planning, what's land, the land use aspect of it. So um, I just want to say that, you know, at, at some point I knew that we were going to make a projection about what we could do and then have to justify that there was a, a reality to it and this would become adopted as a uh, refinement of the comprehensive plan. It was going to have to find a place within the systems of the city to be adopted where other people could implement it. That's kind of where we were. I didn't, you know, so I'm looking at the project mission is to create a plan, not make a park, you see. So there, there's a big distinction and there's a great leap, you know, I said out in the hall that, you know, money and funding can help and change everything and change, change your approach to things. But uh, the, uh, uh, I probably should have changed that slide, but that's okay. One more. Okay. Now, real quick timeline, and I'm I'm told I'm not going to do this in eight minutes. But the uh, the city of Parks is sort of the, you know the name that everybody recognizes. But in two, the city of Parks was a name that was uh, uh, became the, uh, the moniker in 2005, in February 22nd, in 2005. Prior to that is what I'm talking about. Really, uh, there's a uh, this period of time where we were uh, uh, doing planning work. Uh, let me go through what, uh, you know, some of the things we did. Of course, you know, you go through the, uh, the this is the comprehensive planning process, and it's also, a, a, uh, you know, large-scale uh, analysis. 
uh, this is parkland opportunities. You just look at all the land in the Florence Fork area and see what's, what's available and then, and then categorize it by lot uh, parcels over 40 acres or under 40 acres, large parcels, parcels that are owned contiguous by uh, the same person. You see what your opportunities are. Uh, this is the land development ownership analysis, and, and uh, the, the yellow ones were future funds. We knew that there was a special opportunity there. I would take, take a look at natural features, see where you know, you know things come about, and you see the, the meadows and the, the, the ridge tops and the, uh, the bluffs and the points of uh, you know scenic points of view. You know, and, and that sounds like design, but we're really looking for the opportunities where to where to uh, uh, steer this thing. And then we're looking at uh, uh, the connectivity aspect. Well, this was part of the, the comprehensive plan. This was what we were related to. There was a comprehensive plan element uh, for the city to have a 100 mile loop trail. So, great, we're gonna do the, um, basically the Marshall Road, and Shel Taylor's Road uh, to Shelbyville Road component of that. Where would that go? So that was, continuity of that was a key driving force, of course. Now the amount of land that we were going to uh, that would become parkland, you know, we're looking at the net. The na I was looking at the natural process of how that happens in the real world without money. And so, well, it, here's how it happens. At the same time of 2020, there was the the Greenways plan by Met uh, MSD. They were going to uh, when somebody comes in when they go to put a sewer in, they're going to make a greenway. They will connect uh, neighborhoods to other neighborhoods, uh, streets to, to greenways, that sort of thing. When, the country, when somebody comes in for development, the planning commission would say, we, we, uh, we'd like you to save the, uh, the street bluffs and make them green and make them accessible to the public. You're all familiar with that. Okay, so that was the strategy. This was a developmental approach to developing a park. So we would lay out the best opportunity for a park and where the opportunities for development might be quantified and, and prioritized. And I had a sense of that. I've worked uh, on a lot of things in the, in the, throughout the county over the years. And uh, what this is, is an analysis that's based on national park recreation standards for major urban and major regional parks. Uh, how much land would you need if you had a population projection? The population projection supported a certain amount of land area in three categories. Major urban park, community level parks, neighborhood parks. You put that in there based on the population projection for Floyd's Fork, you don't get much park land. And in fact, you can't even connect the dots. So I said, well, we were uh, cooperating with the Parks Department because I felt this was going to be adopted as a part of the comprehensive plan. That's what would help to implement it. So long story short, I said, well, that's 20 years. What's, what about 50 or 100 years? Why don't I just double that demand? Why don't I triple the population growth? And this is a portion of the page that's in this, is in this book. Uh, we uh, refer to it as the Gray Book or the, or the Revere Book. That was the result of the plan. And basically that resulted in a projection of land that we could then say, that's not a design or a plan for parks. That's how much I could justify in 100 years in order to sell the idea. So we then moved on to say, okay, now I'm gonna put on my master planner's hat. What if you had the land, where would you want it to be? Let's, let's look at it now, let's turn it into a design plan. So we call it a concept plan. If you had all the money in the world and you had that need, where would you put it? Here's a concept plan and the difference that you'll see here with what uh, is, it has occurred to date is that this is a very long range plan. It takes the Floyd's Fork corridor, it extends park lands and park network and trail systems up the major streams uh, uh, up to uh, 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 major parks, uh, Long Run Park. It goes into the other counties. It's a plan that, was, that basically says in the long run, the, city, the county, Metro and Louisville should be looking at uh, developing a park system in the incremental developmental mode. Well, what changed? Uh, let me back that up. Well, what changed is we did do, we did that plan, and uh, and, and then uh, David Jones and Dan Jones got excited. 
So then it became the difference between planning for the future in an incremental developmental way to let's get the land and now it becomes a master planning design project. And from that point on, this was in uh, uh, late uh, 2003, 2004, 2005, there is a, is a period of marketing, uh, some land acquisition, and then the unveiling of the city of parks as a concept, where, and then in late 05, federal funding, and then we'll come, take it from there. But at that time, we then entered into a phase of selecting a consultant to do, to do that real visualization. Uh, the WR team and the Bravira team have carried forward with that, and this project changed. Money changed everything. So what we're, we're not waiting for people to donate the, the land as they develop it. We were acquiring land and assembling land and, 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 and because of the, the difference. So there were, that's, I just want to give a little background on the difference of how the idea was, uh, was initiated and, and how Dan Jones and David Jones were able to um, um, be the spark. You know, they, 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 they liked the idea so much that they transformed the idea into a, uh, one that could be implemented. And this is very uncommon. I mean, this is not the original approach was really one that is, is generally the approach of all jurisdictions throughout the United States of plans that uh, occur over time. But with their uh, with their enthusiasm, money uh, money was donated, land was acquired, and then and then uh, the amount certainly made a difference. But it was their uh, it was their excitement uh, about making it happen that is, is why we're here today. Uh, I want one last thing. You've probably seen a couple of other things, but uh, one of the promotional materials that uh, was done during that interim period in the selection of consultants in the publication of the master plan, and Jim will be talking about design. Uh, this, this is the fold-out map that was part of that first promotional piece. And it was just uh, sort of like eye candy. This is what you could do. This is how the Floyd's Fort uh, could contribute to the, the loop trail. And these are the, the kinds of exciting things you might do. Wasn't a design at that time. It was, it was, a, uh, it was basically a land plan uh, with, a, with, a, with a great uh, initial idea that it ought to be done. That was Dan's. That would be that. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> All right, so foundationally, you got a couple things thus far. We have one, an acknowledgement and a recognition that's unique to the United States about the importance of parks to shape urban infrastructure. Very few communities that can say does a park professional have that. Number two, you have a professional analysis that I looked at the local needs, regional needs, and future needs, and the land to say, yep, it's worth doing here. So, those are two interesting steps. Now the question is, how do you pull together all 80-ish different parcels of land into one coherent park? And here to tell us some of those stories is Kevin Beck, who is our project manager. Kevin. Thank you, Scott. So I was um, in a lot of early meetings with Dan Church, and I understand about half the stuff he says anyway, too. So if you, if you miss a lot of that, you're not alone. Thanks, <laughs> I also want to say that we work with some very smart people, as evident tonight. A lot of the smart people are women. They're smart enough not to be up here tonight, but it's not an all-guy project. There's a lot of very smart women on this project, too, who we can't live without. Um, so about 10 years ago, I started working with Dan. We were the first two employees of 21st Century Parks. It was he and I at a desk. I think we were looking back and forth at each other. And Dan Church had identified the project can happen, and so my job early on was to go try to stitch together this mosaic of property, like like Scott said, it's about 80 parcels. Like it's, it's not really 80 parcels, it's probably 80 agreements, 80, 80 transactions, everything from a fee simple purchase of a farm to an agreement with Homeland Security to get under 64 over there, which was crazy, to going under the railroad track, which is even harder to do if you've ever worked with the, the railroad commission. So there's a lot of, 
lot of uh, acquisitions and things like that uh, that we had to we had to do. For instance, uh, specifically this park, Beckley Creek Park, was really Miles Park, up an old Miles Park on Shelbyville Road, and then cobbled together about a dozen other parcels now around it to make what is now Beckley Creek Park. So it started with a kind of a lonely, forgotten park up at the top to a place like Scott said that. How many people have visited this year? Yeah, yeah. 800 thousands, that's all. So, um, first of all, we identified with, I'm not really a slide guy, I use maps. So we, we pull out a big map and we had the topo lines and because we have 20, uh, we have the Louisville loop, which we always said is gonna be ADA compliant, so a person in a wheelchair can use it. it means it can't be over 5% grade. So when you get up to a cliff, you can't go straight to the cliff. Yeah. Yet. You either build a switch back or you, step back a little bit and you say, okay, we can't go up that cliff, but there's a ridge line over here we can kind of go around. So we might, instead of buying that farm, which is right line, we might go out this one so we can get around that natural stop that we had, right? So once we identified parcels that we really thought made sense, and it was kind of my job, because I was dumb enough to go out and knock on people's doors. So it was either a cold phone call or a knock on the door and there's neighbors out here that I've seen that, that I know there's Tim. I mean, a lot, of, raise your hands. How many people live in this area? There are, there's, I know there's some people that are actually our neighbors. I hope we're being good neighbors. Um, I gotta tell you, a lot of people were really happy when I knocked on their door about a park. They were excited, come on in, here's some coffee, let's talk about it. And it was a sale and all we had to do was worry about, you know, what the money was gonna be. And I'll be honest with you, a lot of people didn't want the park. You know, they moved out here for a reason. I want to be alone. I'm worried about people. And I'm worried about trash. And all understood. Because my first line with these people were, hey, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a realtor. And their, their shoulders just kind of slumped down. You know? That's a way to disarm somebody. Tell them you're not a lawyer or you're not a realtor. <laughs> so um, a lot of people took longer. It took a, and, and some people said no. And so we had to find a different way. And a lot of people, um, it, took, uh, it took years. And it took years to, one group, it took years to make, a year to make contact, and then a year to kind of get them comfortable with us, and then six more months to kind of seal the deal for, for a very small parcel that we needed. So it was not an easy thing to do. Um, and, but I think, it's, I, I think it's kind of neat how it's all come together. And like I said, I, the best word I can say is it's, it's a mosaic. You know, it's a... When you look at the the first slide that Scott had up there, the actual outline of the park, it makes no sense. It's, you know, hundred years from now, people are going to look at that and say, "What a weird looking park!" I mean, why, why is it shaped so weird? But you know, that's there's a reason the land was out here. There's only two really great parcels by great meaning that you can use them. They're they're kind of flat and they, they don't flood. We're we're on one now, and the other one's right across there. Everything else is kind of a slope. Uh, it's a cliff, it's floodplain, it makes great parkland. You think about Cherokee Park. Cherokee Park's a beautiful park. The land is worthless, right? It's all slope and floodplain and crazies. But for a park, it's great. This place is great. But I have to tell you. All right, so we put the land together. And um, what Kevin didn't touch on is every single purchase was made free of eminent domain or condemnation. And you'd be hard pressed to find a park project in the United States that was able to put together this amount of acreage without the heavy hand of government on top. And that's a, that's a statement of credit to the residents of the region and the families who made a lifetime decision to be a part of the project this way. Scott, can I add just one comment? Of course. Um, Kevin's being a little humble. Um, you know, we did over 80 separate real estate transactions. Uh, when we started, when Dan Church did his analysis, Metro Parks had three parcels, the old Miles Park, the old Floyd's Fork Park, and the Tyler Schooling property, which is across the creek. Steve Henry and Future Fund had five properties that were in the corridor. So, you know, we met with that, both the city and Steve very early in the process and got sort of provisional agreement, yeah, we like the project, you know, you know our land will come in in some form or or fashion, so we said that's great. And a lot of Dan Church's analysis was to tie that together. But think of this, in essentially seven years, from 2006 to 2013, we did a couple acquisitions before that, um, largely Kevin's work out in the field, um, we assembled 
total connectivity from Barstown Road to Shelbyville Road. You know, and over 80 separate parcels, and that is, I mean, you know, and no condemnation. I mean, every one of these transactions was either an arm's length transaction, a permit process with the city. So I just want to emphasize, Kevin's very humble about that, but it's quite a remarkable achievement, and we really couldn't have done it without his ability to go out and sit down with people in a very non-threatening way. He's funny about it. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a realtor. But that's a pretty scary thing. You know, you've got to go out and knock on somebody's door. You don't really know if they're going to talk to you or not talk to you or, you know, whatever. So I just want to, I want to make that point. I, to me, that is one of the most remarkable achievements of this whole project was the ability to assemble the land. So. It's not hard to spend money. <laughs> so we had about 120 bucks left, and uh, the next gentleman was brought on board, Mr. Jim Walters, who is going to walk us through the architecture, the design, and the experience that you enjoy today. Jim. Thank you. I. Uh, I think that, and all those people had dogs. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> think about that. <laughs> Big ones. <laughs> Architectural elements. Okay, this is going to be a real riot now. <laughs> this is not, okay. I missed the. Uh, oh. Uh, it's not turning. It's not turning. To the right. Oh, right. <laughs> connectivity. Um, this, uh, I just wanted to go back for just a second to the word connectivity because if you, you've seen the maps and the funny shapes and the 80 parcels and the five, you know, the future fund and the, the parks and all that. When you, but uh, when you sit down and try to design something, it's like, oh gosh, this is all kind of funny. And how are we going to? How are people going to know they're even in the park? You know, because. Um, it's a landscape already, it's there, it's bottomland, farmland, in some cases up on the hills, wooded, meadows, it's agricultural. So as, uh, so as we struggled, or as we, as we got started, we, we tried to figure out, well, what are we going to do in this park, and, and what, what's going to make it a park, and, and what, uh, how are we going to connect it all, and my job was not only connecting it in the Dan Church and land acquisition way of, of stitching it together, but to visually make it connected. So you know that you're in there, because otherwise you're in 4,000 acres within you know, 25,000 acres of other stuff that just looks like farmland. So how do we make it something special? So that's when we all got involved with trying to come up with the big idea. And so when I was asked to come up with some big idea, I thought, well, I always get involved in something like this. It kind of wears you out, you know. And, and Kevin and me sitting there saying, well, you know what, like when, you just think, someday when we finally open this thing out and people come out there, what are they doing? What are they, what are, what are they, what are they, what are they, what are they doing? So we thought, oh, well, they're playing ball and doing this stuff. And I mean, the 90%, 10% was a, was a journey to get Absolutely. to that because it started out with oh we got to have a lot of stuff like that for people to come out and do, but the doing began began to be giving people like you and me access to some wonderful places and then the in the general landscape that is already here, this this just Kentucky. I mean, it's, it's, somebody said it's not the Grand Canyon, you know, it's just Kentucky, but it's beautiful and it had, and it's quintessential. And it's been there historically for a long time. And there are reasons that it looks the way it looks. There are all kinds of imprints and shadows of history that have made it what it is today. So maybe we can capitalize on that. Maybe we can inform people about that. Maybe we can enrich the experience of coming out. Maybe you're walking through a field, but maybe, gosh, maybe you know more about it than you ever, than you ever could. You know about the minerals and the trees and the this and that and how it all affects you and how you affect it. And, so that's how we started thinking about it. So the big idea for 
those of us working on the design, which I'm just one of a large team of people, uh, was to um, find the things that would make it remarkable. Who wanted to be remarkable? That's another Olmsteadian bar, I guess you would say, that everyone wanted to make sure that this was at least as good as Cherokee Park. This was going to be uh, a new interpretation, that this wasn't hearkening back to some, you know, 19th century uh, or early 20th century concept as much as it was to come up with some new ones of our own. So I think if you spend some time in the park and looking and enjoying it and walking the trails, you're going to see uh, examples of that. And that character that we would like to give it and have given it and are going to finish uh, as we go down to Barstown Road, uh, came from ideas of um, these elements that are there. I mean, this is the Kentucky landscape. Why not celebrate that? So our, our inspiration for all of the elements in the park came from this land and from the region that we're in. It came from uh, this part of Kentucky that we live in. It came from this era that we live in. And so all of the bridges, the buildings, the trails, the paths, the plazas, the uh, fences, the gates, the site lighting, the site furnishings, the signage, it's all going to be part of one big idea. And you're going to know that this is a consistent, ongoing thing that's going to be a connecting it's going to be a connecting concept. It's going to be connecting visually, and you're going to get it. You're going to know you're in that park from Barstown Road up to Shelbyville Road. And these are the images that we began to look at that, that were so quintessential to Kentucky. Uh, and, uh, you know, just to point out some of the things that, 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 I want, that I want you to look for when you go through, you know, all the buildings kind of get their genesis from this from this uh, coal barn uh, concept and from the idea that you have uh, in the old tobacco barn, you look in and the inside is a glow with this warm honey color. And it's that imagery that uh, we then began to uh, uh, contemporize and play with uh, to give us these buildings so that they come of that. They are part of that history. They're part of that landscape. They're part of those old barns that used to be here. And the materials and the way that you see the honey color peeking out, which is a lot like those other barns I showed you pictures of. This is the inside of this building, and you see the hay stacked on the sides. So don't you see the, you walk out here in this hallway and you'll see the, the kind of uh, way that that has been uh, a metaphor for that. I guess. So, so we're all about this big metaphor. Uh, the, Stone fences that run through um, Kentucky. How do we use those? How do we implement those? How do we introduce those? What do we do with them to contemporize them to make it work for us? But it's it's an exciting and, and, and a thrilling thing to do to bring something to life and to have it be uh, of uh, of its place in that way. And then we want to we want to have some uh, I guess I call them poetics. Uh, metaphors or things. If we set up some rules about how we're going to design this thing that will be consistent, then that will give us that connectivity and consistency. So there were three big, big ideas. They wanted big ideas. I gave them three big ideas. <laughs> Come on, tell about this, guys. <laughs> Here's three big ones. First one is the leap. We Talked about bridges, you know, there are a lot of county bridges and bridges that go all through, and, and the bridges are, is, is a way to get from one side of a, of a, of a crevasse or a river or a chasm or a, um, a bog or whatever to the other. And so that, that's very utilitarian. But in a park, you want to express something that's good. You want to know that, that you're making that crossing. And we thought about how animals jump over obstacles and over uh, things that are in the way. And we design bridges to emulate that movement and become the leaping bridge. 
You see his heavy haunches on the one side, and the more muscle than the bigger steel, and it thins out, arcs over, and touches down ever so lightly on the other side. That's a leaper, my friend. <laughs> So this is a model of, uh, of it that we, that we built so, so Mr. Jones will let us build it. Because <laughs> it sounded kind of funny to everybody when we said we wanted leaping bridges and we were afraid it, it wouldn't stay put or something. So, uh, and, and these are kind of in, in reality. So I hope when you go on all the bridges you will kind of, you will kind of feel that, that aha moment when you get up and you come over that, that, uh, that arch and, and feel and understand, and always the high point is always over the deepest part of the river, which is another interesting thing. So, a little tidbit, uh, what do we mean by Flo? Well, Flo was one of the gals who used to live here in Toronto. <laughs> so he bought her land, so she moved out, so we decided to take over and make her part of the deal. Uh, <clears throat> the flow is, has to do with how water uh, how the water and the creek uh, interacts with the earth as it, as it goes down through that meandering course, and also uh, when it and, uh, you know when it encounters something, there's a, there's a there's a sense of movement that you see here in this fossil that was left from a flood situation, a tree, a, a tree that has uh, been uh, wrapped with uh, floating material, and that that tells you about that movement, and so. We took the way these bridges, the way the, the, the paths come upon the bridges, uh, and, and, and literally created those kinds of uh, sense of flow so that you get a sense of how the water is flowing under that bridge. And, and uh, that flow then, you know, began to uh, inspire us and inform us on how we might think of doing all the, the walks. And if you walk around here, you see all the ways that walks come together and they display a part and there's these things we call knuckles where they come together and things happen the material change and go scooting off another way. Well those are all uh, those are all uh, where how this is being disassociated in the way you know you have a creek coming down it hits something and splatters and goes into three things so so th that little sketch up there on the right is kind of how this whole park is put together. If you see how all these paths come together, and when you come into an area where there's going to be trailheads and all that, the way the plazas work, it's all these things coming together and bouncing off in a certain way. And that creates movement. This is some early ideas about how this building that we're in, which is that building on the edge of this river, finding the sweet spots for the views, up and down, and it begins to take form, and there, then you see all how these things are coming together and swooping back, and then there's an eddy, you know, there's something going back the wrong way, and it's, it's spinning, and it turns into a picnic shelter, and there you go. <laughs> I'm not that for a big idea. <laughs> well, that's, Flo did that. <laughs> I just watched. And that's what Flo looks like when you put it all together and you see how these things are coming together and they're moving and they're having a sense of, you get a sense that you are in a place where water is moving and the, and the paths and the loop and so forth are moving with it so that you're always in, uh, you're not in control of it but you are in, uh, you are associated with it and you are uh, compatible with it. And then you have the electric tower which doesn't flow. <laughs> Dutch, this is how we thought, well, here's the last big idea. Every time we come down to the river, we're going to touch the river. We're going we're to come down to it. We're going oh, to look at it. We're going to look over it. We're going to come down, just like this building. If you look out there, it's like coming up, shooting out, and oh, there's out there on the patio, and down there, there's that river, and there's a place over here that you come down that walk and come out, and it's, it's there too. So. Those are those touch points. And then, so around the bridges and how the things work, there are places, this is where you get to be down there, right by the water, and experience the water uh, close at hand, feel it, get the sense of it, see how it floods, look at the lines on stuff, you know, where the water got up to and all that. Uh, canoe launches that uh, take you down to, uh, so you can get your, uh, 
your stuff down, your canoe down, and then it gave us wonderful opportunities to come down and stop and overlook and have a, pla a special place. And those are the special places that we look for. You can say, well, it's not the Grand Canyon, but I think it's I think it's fun to be there. It's a great lake to fish in. It's a great place to be. The fog is lifting. It looks like a beautiful day. And we wanted the park to be well loved and well used. Because that means it's going to have a good long life because people are going to take care of it and cherish it. And that's what we're after. We want to have big ideas, try real hard, and do it the hard way, not the easy way. And there's been a lot of things we've done the hard way. But I think it's uh, I think it's paid off, and uh, and it's a it's it's a great gift. Everybody that's worked on it, and all the people who have supported it, and their members, and given money, and given time, and planted trees. Thank you. It's a wonderful gift. Okay, so Jim just laid out the architectural design, and it's now my pleasure to bring forth the guy who brings the natural side into the project. The person who picks all the plant species and makes sure that everything around him is beautiful, and that is our park superintendent, Gary Rebecca. Thanks, Scott. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to kind of give a different story. Um, everybody's been talking about adding something to this park. I'm taking things away. <laughs> um, basically, one of the problems we have is the base of species here. And all these natural areas that you see out here, um, you see all that open gaps between the trees, they were full of just bush on each and other invasive plants. And one of the first tasks I that when I started this job almost two and a half years ago I was reading Michael Gage's natural reports that he put together about this land, but also going through all the bush honeysuckle and trying to locate any smaller trees that we could save for the future generations to take uh, over for these larger trees. So there was quite a bit of work that's done here, and unlike Kevin, I won't be humble, our staff has done a lot of hard work here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but my, part of my job is removing all that stuff, and um, we've done it in-house, and Chris Chandler is here from Echo Tech. He's also done that for some of our grants that we uh, received, equip grants to help offset some of those costs of the removal. So when we're removing all this bad stuff, we got all that woody stuff we have to take out first, and then we got all the herbaceous weeds that are kind of in the way next. So it's this process of removal, removal, removal. What we found in some areas is after two or three years, the amount of wildflowers and the amount of seedlings that we've been able to save are, are multiplying like crazy. So one of the things we're looking at long term is also do we add some trees or do we add some more plants? But in the meantime, I'm kind of letting certain areas go to kind of see how nature is going to respond naturally. And maybe we can save some money and we don't have to do a lot of replanting. And as we work down south, we've Kind of following construction and removing all the cut stump, cut stump treatment and re sprouts. And uh, one of the things we found there, weeds are pretty formidable, uh, especially <laughs> poison hemlock, and giant ragweed, Johnson's grass. And we've established some meadows and we're doing it a little quicker than maybe ideal, but it's a battle and you know we do have a plan in place. And Part of that plan is also keeping records every year, so we know what we've done and what we're going to do next year. So that there's also this written record that if something comes in the future, they can say, well, how did the landscape get from what it was to what it is now? And part of the plant selection that we go through is when we look into these areas, kind of like look around at 360 degrees, what does it look like from the uh, overlook over there? And then what does it look like from the road? And just trying to get that total view because you want plants, if you're going to choose plants to go back in there, they got to kind of fit. And also knowing what's growing there kind of gives us indications of what other plants will grow there. Some of the hardest areas for us are right along here, the riparian areas. They're very narrow, there's a few trees like sycamore, silver maples, box elders. They get beat up pretty bad by this river, this flow. Uh, this river is pretty powerful. And how do we uh, expand that planting 
and plant the right plants is very critical. Uh, and also looking at it from a four season type of uh, concept. Whereas now the sycamores are kind of the stars in the, of the winter landscape. You see them here or there. They kind of really stand out at that nice little park. Uh, when we start thinking about planting uh, red buds or dogwoods or rye ferns, things that are going to bloom in the spring, we've got to have that same attention to detail. You don't want to put too many in there because it's way too much and you just want the splashes of color. So while we're removing all this invasive stuff, it gives us some time to kind of sit back and think about these areas and we all discuss it together before putting that plan together. So there's a lot of design intent that goes into the, the natural areas. The natural areas are probably the most expansive part of this project, kind of envelopes all the work the architects have done. And uh, I think it's also, it, it's what makes this project so special. Is this, it gives you that different feeling from park to park. Because you start off in Shelbyville Road and you're going to head down the Bardstown Road. Uh, Mr. Jones is going to talk about it's you're going to go from a more urban park all the way down through narrow strands, and then you're going to have this rural experience that's just incredible down there when we open it up in a few years. Um, so once we um, deal with those things, there's the edges between the meadows and the trees, and we're working with state biologists right now and some other biologists to kind of figure out how we incorporate the wildlife into those edges. Uh, we recently found out birds like small shrubs outside in the meadows just before the trees. Uh, we're working on plans for salamanders and other beneficial uh, wildlife. Um, deer are not beneficial wildlife to our planting. <laughs> so we have good, we have some, even though we'll use our example for leaping. Uh, they do cause some damage, so we're going to work with them and try to choose plants that we can get a good establishment of uh, a forest back in. Um, as for if you have a yard or if you have a section of woods in your own place, I think I would advise the same thing. If you can identify your plants, kind of look at if you do have invasives, how to get rid of them, if your neighbor does. Um, there's a lot of invasive plants that we plant near this park that I know we're going to be dealing with in the future. So maybe gearing towards any future planning you might do in your yard if you went to natural native plants that are really spectacular. We have a plant list galore here at our PNC Education Center where you can come in if you see something blooming that you don't know what it is, you can come in here and find out. There's a lot of plants out that are native to this area that you can use in your yard that are beneficial for wildlife. Uh, also yourself. And, <clears throat> and the last thing I'd like to talk about, even though I haven't been following the slides, um, there's the egg lawn, and uh, we have a circle of trees around there, but that's going to be you know, more of a formalistic type tree planting. We're going to train on a certain way because we have to keep improving trucks. But you're going to have those meadows and the egg lawn forest in the middle there, the egg yolk and the crack in the egg. So there's a lot of elements here where you have man-made stuff, and then as you get farther and farther away from that, you have the forest and the meadows, and you, you get that experience. And part of our job is trying to blend that man-made into the natural area so it looks seamless, so we're not, um, you know, it doesn't look out of place. Uh, this is another example of some of the lakes at Miles Park, Becky Creek Park now, and all the stuff that was removed and over time, it, the meadows are going to get thicker and thicker and more and more wildflowers. If you were here last year, you know how extensive the wildflowers were. It was, it was incredible. So it would be even better this year. So there will be a lot of things that didn't really bloom last year that take about three years for the seed to flower. And this is just another example of the, the meadow going along the loop. We kind of established a little mowing pattern so that too many things don't flop over on the, the loop there. Going down the area we call Private Rock, you look out on that vast vista of grass, which we started to mow just because it was full of Johnson's grass and we didn't want it going anywhere else, but it turned out to be a soccer field, another place for people to uh, recreate, basically. Going to the point you never know what people are going to do in the park. Every opportunity. Um, that's just a picture from last year all the uh, black eyed Susans that were blooming up there. Uh, along the pond and then our gar garden gateway to the left of that. Um, there's the Grand Lee 
walkway of the country walk. Uh, there's some actually some snowdrops blooming out there right now, even though it's very cold. There's a series of uh, different bulbs popping up, up and down here all year long. The trees are some black gums. This is the, uh, used to be a farm field, very wet. Water is going to be the number one issue I have to deal with forever here. And uh, those are, they can grow in water. So we, we struggled with some drainage issues on this side, but it's working out pretty well. And lastly, part of my job also is that lower section, the strand and the Turkey Run Park is I kind of go out before construction, kind of walk where the loop's going to go, where the park road's going to go, and kind of change if we have to save some trees, we alter the, the location of the road or the loop. And after we flag it out, put the limits of the disturbance, we'll walk it again, make sure we can maximize saving as many trees as possible, especially some of the special ones. So it's, it's a whole process that we go through, even doing that clearing, so we can save the natural areas as much as possible. That's it. Thanks. Thanks, Gary. I hope um, y'all probably picked up on this. We may have architects and horticulturalists, but they really are artists. We think about what they're doing on the landscape and what they're leaving us. Our final presenter will be Dan. He's going to come back and he's going to give us a little sneak peek of what's under construction and what you can be ready to open in 2015. And after that, we'll take questions. All right, just a couple uh, kind of sneak peek, as Scott says. So, um, you know, the four parks Beckley Creek Park, Hopewood Park, an area we call the Strand, Turkey Run, Broad Run. Um, just um, highlighting, you know, Olmstead shows Native American tribal names. <coughs> Uh, Cherokee, Iroquois, Shawnee, when you hear that, it's immediately intuitive as a system. And remember, you go back to the, the point about Olmstead. When Olmstead started, he designed single parks. By the time he was done, anywhere he went, he did systems. And I, I take that as the wisdom of his lifetime of incredible work. So let's, let's listen to him. But that idea of system flows through everything, whether it's the naming of the parks, Jim's themes and connectivity and so on. Uh, so, uh, what I want to talk about is just kind of the southern part, because that's the part that's under construction right now. So, this is uh, what will be the Brown Foreman Silo Center. It's now off of Stout Road, uh, which is <laughs> off of Broad Run Road, uh, off of Seatonville Road, off of Billtown Road. Um, <laughs> if you haven't noticed it, this project has its own vocabulary. Right? Have you, have you, caught that, and this is actually the second generation vocabulary. The first generation were a whole bunch of property names that Dan Church, that he really didn't, you know, he, he, it was a very complicated process, but he identified, you know, probably hundreds of properties. And for the first five years, when it was, you know, when Kevin was talking about it, it was me and him, and Janice, our wonderful assistant, who was somewhere out here, isn't she? Janice, didn't I say, there she is. That was the three of us. Um, that's all we talked about was, you know, the Bell property or the Oster River property or whatever it might be. And then we started hiring all these people and, you know, they want to talk about Broad Run Park. They're like, what's the Oster River property? And so we, Kevin and I sort of had a shift to, uh, but, uh, we call it the name game. And if we could get a beer or two in him, Jim Walters would stand up on the table. He's got a little song about the name game. Uh, anyway. Uh, so the Silo Center is down there off Stout Road. Um, and this is part of Jim's point about um, sort of paying homage, if you will, to the landscape that was here. And so we built a lot of new, fairly modern looking buildings here, but with that vocabulary. So what we wanted to do down there was to actually keep that existing vocabulary. This was the old Jean family farm, and uh, there were, you know, six, seven, uh, I, was at, I think there were the sixth or seventh generation to live on that farm. They were dairy farmers. You know, these aren't uh, historic register type buildings, but we wanted to, you know, really make them the centerpiece of the architecture of that park. And so the silo, it, it actually sits on a half point in the land. We just saw this the other day. We have this beautiful spiral staircase. The, the roof will be pulled off and there'll be a viewing platform and the roof will go, I think it's actually a new roof, but a similar style. It uh, goes on, the old uh, feeding trough becomes a kind of long picnic table. Um, there are several barns that uh, are saved. There was one barn, uh, which we call the event barn, which we wanted to save, but we took the engineers and they said, you cannot bring the public into this barn. So uh, we tore it down, we're gonna rebuild it actually about uh, 40 or 50% bigger, and it'll be like this building. It'll be a place we can hold weddings and outings and 
and so on. So, you know, again, that architectural theme, and then surrounding it is about 1,100 acres of nature. Um, uh, through which we'll run mountain biking trails and hiking trails. Uh, there's a beautiful suspension bridge. It's kind of a canopy bridge up at the at the treetop. So again, you know, how do we make this place uh, different, unique, but you know, kind of responding to what's on the landscape, responding to that 90% use. And I always used to say recreationally that we had a big box that went from very traditional park amenities, things like playgrounds and ball fields through this world-class urban trail system, the Louisville Loop, the walking paths, hiking paths, all the way to the quiet walk in the woods. And then we tried to build those things at every level, from a very basic level, which would be a you know, one month old in a stroller, to um, you know, a slightly out of shape, 50-something like myself, all the way to a really fit 20-something. Um, and so th this, is the quiet, this is the park that really captures the quiet walk in the woods. But we want it to be accessible, whatever your ability level is, we want you to get that experience. We want it to be connected, both architecturally and in terms of uh, physical connectivity, so that you could get on a bike outside this building in a, you know, in a year and a half um, and ride all the way to Barstown Road. And the experience down there is totally different. You know, Kevin mentioned there's a lot of wetland and so on. When we get down there, there's a lot more driving. It's a, it's a lot more topography. Uh, the trail starts to come up out into the highlands, you get great views, um, and so on. So it's a, it's a consistent experience, it's a connected experience, but it's also a very different experience. And if you think about the difference between Cherokee and Iroquois and Shawnee, each one of these parks kind of has that same idea that it, it has its own identity within the system. Let's see what comes up next. Um, so, uh, most of this I've touched on in the Turkey Run Park, the rural design, the agricultural heritage, the adventure programming, that's the mountain bikes and the, you know, the hiking trails and so on, the canopy walk, um, uh, lots of different kinds of features. Again, an event space like this, but totally different. It's a barn, obviously it's a three season space, you're probably not going to get married there in January, particularly not the weather yet this year <laughs> continues. Um, lots of picnic areas. Um, so. But just lots of fun stuff going on. So that's Turkey Run Park. Um, Broad Run Park, we come out, you know, on uh, Barstown Road. So it's not like Shelbyville Road. There's been a lot of growth out there. There's a lot of new rooftops, a lot of, a lot of people. So it, it has many things in common with this park. I call it the, the, these two parks the most people-centric of the parks. Um, the most urban, the most formal. But it is different. Uh, there's a section down there that we call the waterfall district because there's a lot of waterfalls. Uh, some of you may have been to Fairmont Falls Park, which is kind of the most dramatic, but they're all over the place out there. Um, and so our trail system and so on will connect and show people uh, that wonderful landscape. We'll have another great playground and spray ground. Um, that's really the engine of, of Beckley Creek Park. I would say that a very high percentage of the people that found us found us first because they brought their kids or their grandkids out to the playground. And then they realized there were other things for them to do so, we're going to apply some lessons learned, uh, but you know, kind of similar type things, picnic areas, um, probably a dog park. Um, there's the you know, there's sort of a master plan of everything that's in it, and there are the things that we'll you know we'll build when we open it in in 2015. There's going to be what I think is, and this is a Jim Walters innovation. There's going to be a woodland garden, and it's about a 10 to 12 acre space. And our goal is really that. Uh, when that has grown in and really at maturity 10 or 15 years from now, it would be a top 20 garden in the United States. But um, unlike most of those gardens, which are sort of in a private estate, this one would be in a public park. So come back to accessibility. How can we take these kind of amenities and make them accessible? Uh, because that's what public parks do. Um, the 100 year vision is, uh, Gary was also a little humble. Um, uh, one, one of the things, when, when, when Jim Walters designs a building and, and the contractors turn it over, it's generally done. Um, when these guys design a park and turn it over, the work has really just begun. Um, you know, and uh, just all of the things we have to do to grow in the park, and we call that a 100-year vision. So Gary mentioned, you know, this removal of invasive species. I think since he got here two and a half years ago, we've done 750 acres of invasive species removal, that's probably one of the largest urban invasive species removal projects in the country. Uh, we've planted over 50,000 trees. 
Um, and we're really just getting started. So, uh, so you know, those trees around the egg wall, well, you know, every, every couple of years, you've got to start thinking about their shape and their shade and their, um, the, the garden gateway, you know, the, uh, just the, you know, sort of the, you know, what it looks like on a piece of paper and what it actually takes to grow it in. So there, there's a lot of work, and that's what we call the garden year vision. Uh, this was our, we, we did uh, down off Stout Road, we, we planted about 30,000 trees on a 45 acre site. In 100 years, we see that as a bottomland forest, which connects two disconnected forests on either side. So if you're a little warbler making your way north in the springtime, you can move from tree to tree. And that idea of connectivity isn't just about roads and trails and bridges, it's about natural areas and the way in which uh, we rebuild a, a sort of connected what I call 4,000 acres of very high-functioning urban ecology. Uh, uh, of course, we have just, uh, this is um, Floyd's Fork down, I believe, along Echo Trail. Um, just a gorgeous landscape. This is in the Strand, and it's actually, um, I think, one of the most uh, pretty parts. It'll probably never get super visited because you really got to get on your bike or you know, be willing to, to take a decent walk to get there, so even though we're 20 minutes from downtown in Kentucky's largest urban area, you're gonna be able to um, get to this place. Now, if you have the energy, even if you're in a wheelchair, you could get to this place because the Louisville Loop is gonna be right on the left side of the, of the creek there. Um, this is just one of the meadows that uh, Gary's working on. This is one of the smaller waterfalls down in the waterfall district, but they're just all over the place. Um, We'll throw it open to questions. I do just want to say that I think Scott's goal um, in this was to give you a real look at this process. Um, it is a very complex process. Each one of these people represents a whole bunch of other people um, who are doing a lot of really great work. And there is no way we could have brought this project to life without the incredible talents that all these folks and a lot of other people did. Um, Scott mentioned, you know, there's not really uh, many places that do that, and it's because it's it's pretty hard. <laughs> you know, I don't think we really had any idea when we started it just how complex um, or difficult um, it would be. But the reason we were able to get this to the point where we have is because of the talent and the uh, you know the discipline and the hard work of, of the folks we've heard from tonight. So um, I'll throw it open to questions, and please for anybody. Yes, I think Woody Kearns and Jennifer, my wife and I, live for neighbors back in school. And uh, I was raised between Cherokee and Seneca Park. And I will tell you, gentle people up there, you have created a remarkable place. It really is um, it really is special. Amen. Organization. The organization for whom I work has had meetings here, and more importantly, Senator walks in this park every day when the temperatures are low. So she walks in the last six months. <laughs> so my question really to you all is sort of about how the naming game process and recognition in general, okay? Beckley Creek, you named the park. I can't find Beckley Creek on any on any map. You can help me do that. I, mean, I know where the voice is out there because it flows behind the house. It's literal, it's right there. Um, it is. Uh, it's, but, but Mr. Miles, he gave the part of the park that's from Shelbyville Road at least to the 64, I think. And it was called at, you've seen it up here for a while, but that's sort of gone by the wayside. That's one question. What happened to that? Why is it Beckley Creek rather than Mile Creek? I guess we didn't want to think it was a trotting track. I don't know. But, right. uh, <laughs> and secondly, uh, Bob Bell, Bob and Nancy Bell, you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. In their uh, Oak Park Grove is the back of their property over here. I think they need to be recognized more because they, they love this area and they gave that to the Conservancy to do this. And uh, I guess those are the two things. That we agree. Why Miles wouldn't name, you know, more just other than Miles Lake because he gave a major portion of the property and then the, uh, the Oak Park Grove, which is the only part of the Bell property that's. Well, uh, so I mentioned earlier that we, you know, we chose tributaries as sort of the consistent integrated naming. So we essentially pick the major tributary in each park. And Beckley Creek is, if you, if you go to the next time when it's kind of light, you go to the playground and look over those stone walls at the back, and that comes from the west. 
It comes from the north. It flows down pretty much along Beckley Station Road. It really probably just heads right up there, you know, south of Shelbyville. It might be a little bit to the west, but it comes under 64 in a pipe, I think, and then past the, uh, the little sod operation and then under Wibble Hill, and it's there. Uh, it's actually a remarkable creek, though. We had fish and wildlife down here last spring. Uh, we went out, and in about 20 or 30 minutes, we netted 15 or 16 different uh, fish species, including some, you know, reasonably sized bass and so on. There's a lot of turtles. The only otters I've ever seen out here, I saw on Beckley Creek, although they're around. So that's, that's where Beckley Creek comes from. Um, the Miles family, uh, it was called Miles Park. Um, you know, our decision to rename the parks after tributaries meant that that really didn't make sense. Um, it was also, as Kevin mentioned, it was the first parcel, but we, we acquired 15 additional parcels between the southern end of Miles Park, which was just north of the MSD plant, and South English Station Road. So we had, and that, part, that parcel I think was about 100 acres, or something like that. This is now about a 600 acre park. So we wanted the naming to be consistent with the whole system. Uh, we wanted to recognize the Miles family and with their blessing, uh, we changed that section to the Miles Trailhead and the Miles Lake section of Miles Park. They recognized that it was now part of a bigger project. Um, and, I, you know, uh, we love the Bells, uh, the, you know, we met with them, actually Bob Hill, one of the first interviews he did with us, you know, fortunately shortly before their very tragic death. You know, we have them on film, we have them on tape, we have them telling their amazing story, which if you don't know, um, let me know and I'll give you my card and I'll send you Bob's story um, because they lived very interesting lives and it's just a function of of um, you know, trying to find a balance within the you know the, the naming process, and um, that's just sort of where we ended up. I mean, I don't really have a, a specific answer to that one, but um, okay. Other questions? And and what type of trees did we plant down there at the step one? All right, Gary, you want to take that one? Yep. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I don't know if I can remember them all, but we planted walnuts, hickories. Hazelnuts, persimmons, uh, red oaks, white oaks, swamp white oaks, chestnut oaks, cherry bark, cherry bark oak, uh, pecans, and um, all the trees. <coughs> trees, cherry trees, and actually there are some areas that didn't uh, perform as well because it was so wet down there. Um, I ordered a bunch of different trees, there's going to be some water oaks and some other interesting plants that can tolerate more water that we're going to add this spring when they come in. And so um, there's probably going to be closer to 20 different types of species down there. Plus you have these silver maples, sycamores, and box elders surrounding the area that are trying to move it in. So it's a constant fight. Right. There was a question in the back. Yes. Uh, my name is Ann Tincher. I've been to several of these meetings over the course of several years. And you show the picture of that beautiful stone wall along Floyd's Court. And I have seen that on horseback. And as president of the Kentucky Trail Riders Association, I wondered if horses will be welcomed in the park for you know people to ride. And if so, when? And also, my other question is about the old Iron Gate property, if that was going to be part of the plan for equestrians. So, um, the Iron Gate property, let me just go back here. All right, so uh, right there is what she's talking about, um, is the Iron Gate property. So, um, equestrian uh, trails are in the master plan. Um, they are not um, currently being planned or funded, although we have um, had a discussion with all the way up to Jane Bashir um, about this. And um, our object with the equestrian side of this thing is to say, um, as we've done with everything else. So when we did the canoe planning, we sort of zoomed out and talked to you know all of the people from the mayor's blue water you know, trail plans to, to the local paddling groups and so on. How does this fit into the regional vision? And I think um, that for whatever reason, uh, the equestrian discussion on that has been the most complicated, which is one of the reasons why it has been hard for us, because what we want to do is, um, is uh, 
if, if whatever it is that we attack, you know, whether it's paddling or education, we want to find a niche that we think fits within the boundaries of the park, connects with what goes on around it. I mentioned that idea, so we have to think about not what is just in the park, but what goes on around it. Um, serves a need, can be built, maintained, and so on. And I, to, to be frank about it, I think that the equestrian discussion has been the most difficult discussion. So we have heard, you know, build 25 miles of trail, build a horse park like they have in Lexington, uh, build a camping uh, ground that can host 250 trailers with riders, build a 4 H facility. And so, in my conversations with, um, particularly with Mrs. Bashir, who's very interested in this issue, is what we have asked for is bring all these groups together, right? Get all, get everybody around the table and say, if you look at Louisville and you look at what exists in terms of the equestrian facilities, what is needed, uh, then where are the best places to go and where can we fit in that the best? Because to be honest, it's, it's kind of a cacophony of different people asking for different things. We can't accommodate all of those things. You know, things that we love are the idea, we had a great conversation initially with the Spencer County Trail Riders Group about their trail plan. And so the question was, could we be one of the gateways into that trail plan, right? If they go out and build this 100 mile loop, could we be one of the places that people come and start? So, because, you know, we can accommodate a certain number of miles, we can't accommodate 100 miles. So, so I'm, not, I, I, it, it, I'm not dodging the question. It is a very complicated question. We're interested in it, but we feel like that there needs to be, there are so many different groups within the equestrian community with different needs. We know we can't accommodate them all. And so, before we go plunging in and trying to solve one problem, we would like to say to that community and Metro Parks and the Spencer County Trails Plan, there's an Oldham County Plan, Shelby County just opened a horse park. Where is the niche in which we can be the most useful? The most? And so, and that's basically where we are. Well, thank you for your candor. Yeah. I know it's difficult, so. Yeah, I mean, it's, we, yes. Use the Seneca Park model. Look what Rock Creek does for Seneca Park. You've got a question center down here that they could play that same role, I think. No question, and we had a trail designed for Betsy Webb, and unfortunately, you know, her operation didn't make it. So, um, but you know, that that was part. She had her summer campers out, I think, two years, um, and we cut about a mile and a half trail for them. So there, there are also kind of opportunistic ways that we're able to serve it as well. Will there be a uh, safe way to cross Taylor's Mill Road? Yeah. Okay. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> So, so about the catapult, man. Yeah. <laughs> we have we got a, we got a pretty cool catapult. We have a zip line. Uh, no, we, we actually have a plan that is um, sitting in front of. Who's it sitting in front of now? State. Or, <laughs> it's, no, it's back to the district, district five of the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet that would go under the Taylorsville Road Bridge. So, um, despite six years of federal approvals of plans that showed us crossing Taylorsville Road. Um, when push came to shove, they were not willing to do an at grade crossing with the light for many, many, and if you all live out here know how complicated that intersection is, so we proposed going under the bridge. They like that idea. We've done the plan, we've passed muster. We actually probably thought maybe two weeks ago we would have approvals, and hopefully we will have that approval. If we were to get that approval tomorrow, um, that would be built and open probably sometime between the end of April and the middle of June. Um, and so we, we fully anticipate that it will, I mean, you know, I don't hang me if, if we get hung up, but, uh, but I think it's, it is um, very close to being approved. It's funded, you know, we, we're paying for it, it's private dollars. Um, we have a good design, um, and it's, it's a very, it's a safe way to get across the road, uh, or get under the road. So, um, so hopefully this year. Yes, Gabby. Um, I just a couple of things. I've worked with you a long time, and he's done everything I've asked him to do. This, <laughs> this is my, my farm. And a uh, couple of suggestions. A sensory 
high rise for a handicap to go around with the herbs mm -hmm. uh, and braille so they can feel. Uh -huh. And um, special Olympics, you might want to think about that here. Um, the special, uh, and also Indian powwow. Okay. Those are three. All right. Um, we do have we very small step towards kind of multi-sensory. We have a small grant from a foundation that supports um, you know eyesight blindness issues, and we built a series of boxes that we can move around and, and so on. So um, we like the idea. Uh, Jim Walters has um, you know done a lot of thinking about kind of some sort of multi-sensory trail, but but it's not it's not. I mean, one of the challenges in this is that you know sort of taking these ideas, but um, I hope that someday that will be it's out really, here. The yeah. Special Olympics they do in the blind school, it's a matter of just having them pull off the road. Yeah, yeah, and the other two, I mean, Scott, we have, he sort of runs our programming and both of those are very doable. We love partners, we love to have Special Olympics yeah. out here, um, so. Knowing what you know now, uh, 21st Century Park is an organization do you have the inclination or the energy to try to replicate this project in another state? Um, <laughs> the inclination, for sure. I don't know about the energy. Um, most importantly, we don't have the money. Yeah. Um, you know, so um, one of the things you know we do try to earn our keep out here, and we have uh, a number of earned income opportunities that, like your membership, do support. Um, we have started a consulting business. We have a consulting contract in Virginia. We have a consulting contract in Indiana where we basically try to share what we've learned, which is that little 10-step diagram. It looks kind of silly, but when you sit back and, and really think about the issues, um, where most projects run into to problems is governance. They don't have a clear governance model um, and long-term sustainability. I mean, you know, we just kind of had a conversation with a public agency today, I won't say which one, um, they were talking about building new infrastructure and the question was asked about what do you do in the event of the snow? And basically, they didn't say this, but wait for it to melt is the answer. So, you know, that's not, um, there, there's not, you know, you shouldn't build infrastructure without a long-term plan. So yeah, we, I mean, I'd love to do more. I don't, I, you know, it'd be very unlikely we'd ever have an opportunity like this again. I'm just glad we got to do it more. Yeah. Um, I don't really have a question. I, my name's Dan Dobson, and I live on Seatonville Road, just up the hill. So when you guys cross Seatonville Road, that's going to be an exciting day for us when you open that up, because we just can't wait. We, we haul our bikes over here and ride and, and walk, and, and I've been out here pulling weeds in the flowers and, and continue to do that. But I just, wanted to, I, I just wanted to say kudos to Jim and his crew, his, his team. If you could go back to that slide that showed the aerial view of this building and the playground, the two, yeah. uh, and if you can't find it, that's okay. I know exactly what you're talking about. Like, you keep talking and I'll, I'll get us there. The one thing that just immediately came to mind there, there, is that nature abhors a vacuum and a straight line. And you have, sir, you have captured that. Curves, beautifully, I love that. I have a small, Flower gardens and walking past my backyard is not a straight line at anywhere, much to my wife she read for shit it's a more garden is much better. But we love this park and just right. cannot wait. You play that hell. He's he's your neighbor. Is that your cousin? Yeah. Well tell him mom. Oh oh no. <laughs> No, it's uh, funny, one of the contractors called me up and said, I, I think I found a mistake on one of your drawings here. There's a 90 degree angle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, let, let me just say a word about it. My dad calls Jim the cosmic architect, and a lot of people don't know this, but Waterfront Park was really, I mean, Hargraves was the brilliant designer, but Jim Walters is the guy that brought it to life. Same thing for Michael Graves in the Humana Building. When Olmstead Parks Conservancy did most of their planning, Jim was on their board and really was their architectural guru. The beautiful waterfront, what's the name of your building? Park Park Place. Uh, park Place down by the, the waterfront park was designed by Jim and, and Revere. And I could just sort of go on and on. The whole downtown plan around Waterfront Park, back to that issue, it's not just what happens in the park, but it was around. I think Jim was the chair of that that process and we would, I mean, not only has his firm 
um, contributed these brilliant designs, but it's it's not easy, particularly with sort of the, you know the out of town architect Wallace Robertson Todd. Um, there's always a challenge working uh, over distance, but to take all of the challenges that we gave Jim, you know, people in nature, Olmsted is the bar, um, connectivity, access, special places, theater, um, and, you know, we couldn't have done it without him. And I just think, and, I, and Dan Church is is a big part of that too. I mean, Dan, that that plan looks kind of uh, it's 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 hard to understand sort of the planners. It's a very technical um, profession. Um, but it, it, the work that those guys did were amazing. And this, I mean, you know, we love our out-of-town architects, but I can tell you right now, without those two guys, this park would not exist, and it would not have the quality that it has. So. I have time for one more question. But I just want to say, Dan also painted a whole bunch of really, really nice things. And uh, the, the city of parks phrase was a phrase that I coined when we started this project because I really would like it to be our brand as a city. I think in the 21st century to own that brand would be spectacular. I don't think Possibility City, with all due respect, doesn't do a whole lot for me. <laughs> and it doesn't say anything authentic about what we are. We're one of only four parks, four cities in the country that have a completely, a, a full homestead system that was built to completion. Um, and it's the only one that circled the city. Um, my daughter is a freshman at Yale. She's taking a class called Study of the City with a guy named Alexander Garber, who's a very famous city planner. He says the best urban park in America in the late 20th century was Waterfront Park. Um, so anyway, but the city, that slide Dan showed where they had, the, they had Dan's artwork, which was originally painted for our first fundraising <laughs> campaign in the city of parks, uh, idea they sort of appropriated and put on signs all over, even the the, uh, the style font, the font style is from our original book, so just a little bit of insight, but, uh, but I love Jerry Emerson, he did a great job at, uh, you know, standing up and saying this project is important, and, and we give him credit for that, and we were happy to be part of the City Parks Initiative, so I have one more in the back, and we'll be happy to, we'll hang around for a few minutes if you want to ask a question. Uh, with the spring rains coming, we've paddled so far down the Echo Trail and our kayaks with the water up. Awesome. Will there be opportunities to take out further down before the 2015 opening? Uh, we took out our bridge one time, climbed with boulders, and it kind of sucked the same I, 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 <laughs> Is that on Seton Hill Road? Yeah. I've made that climb many so, times. Yeah. Uh, will there be anything open this spring where we can get down a little bit further, maybe? Okay. And then number two, real quick, are there any volunteer opportunities for Turkey Run or anything, any construction or anything like that, or is that all commercial? I think King Run is as far south as we go until 2015. Um, there are always volunteer opportunities, and you can, you know, touch base with Scott, and he can refer you to it. Um, and that, that's the last point. Um, this project is fully funded, and it will be complete next year. Uh, from Shelby Thank you all again for taking time to come up tonight. Again, I know there's some folks that have their hands up. Um, please come up and find us, and we'll be happy to take your questions. And thank you again for your support.